would grow a thick crop of all seed rape. They'd have it in the spring. They'd go out and put their whatever 220 kilos of nitrogen on it and never cease to be disappointed, you know, in how poor the yield was that they'd have this very thick crop. They'd have this, you know, huge reflection of light for a few weeks while it should be filling the pods. And then also you tend to get more lodging and that sort of thing, which makes that the crop harder to harvest. So it, it is easy to overcook it. You know, I would have heard years ago, anecdotally in the UK, that people could never believe. They, they were always surprised by how well they yielded, often as well as or better than their thick crops. And that was really because they were applying enough nitrogen to get their thin crops to the correct canopy size and overcooking the big ones. Oilseed rape is the first crop to show a spurt of growth every year, and this year is no exception. The very wet conditions over the winter have been very hard in some crops, but others in drier ground are looking well. These crops will require different management to realise their full potential. You are listening to the latest episode of The Tillage Age with me, Michael Hennessy. We would really appreciate it if you could listen, follow and give us a review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. There are more management levers which can be used in oilseed rape in the early season than other crops. I'm delighted today to be joined by John Spink, the Head of Crops, Environment and Land Use in Chagas, who has extensive experience researching these growth habits and the tools which can be used to manage crop canopies. John, before we start talking about oilseed rape, we replayed your talk for the National Tillage Conference a couple of weeks ago, where you talked about carbon footprinting in Irish cereals. It's a very positive story, but there was a little bit more information on the topic last week. Did that confirm some of the data that you presented at the National Tillage Conference? The farmer data that we that we uh, analysed really confirmed what we'd found from the from the experimental work. Uh, and, and what we'd suspected in the Irish grain has a has a very low uh, carbon footprint if you compare it to some of our international competitors. Okay, so hopefully we can exploit that as the, as the thing goes by. John, I wanted to talk to you though a little bit more really around uh, oilseed rape, and obviously in the past you've done a lot of work in oilseed rape research and across in, in in the UK and a bit here in Ireland as well. Um, and you've, you've done a lot, I, I suppose, in terms of. Um, you know how crops develop uh, over time, and um, looking at around the tools um, that might be used by by farmers or agronomists out there to try and uh, influence the crop at that stage. I suppose if we look at the crops out there this year, some of them have probably struggled a bit. Um, there was, I suppose, a lot of wet weather all the way from the harvest last year. There was heavy slug populations. There's probably, you know, there's wet patches in crops. There's thin patches in crops. And I suppose there probably are going to be different management um, things that people are going to have to put in place uh, to to manage those crops. But we might just maybe just focus a little bit in terms of a crop stand out there because there are some thinnish looking crops out there. How many plants per meter squared um, are, are needed to develop into a decent crop? And does it matter if those plants are relatively big at this time of the year or they've been grazed quite a lot by pigeons? All right. Okay. So I'll start off with the first part of that, Michael. How many plants do you do you need? We I, I would normally say if you have one plant per square foot or nine plants per square meter, uh, ten plants per square meter thereabouts, that's enough to produce a canopy that's big enough to reach the yield potential. Um, and I suppose if you think if you you know if, if you spill a, a oil seed rape seed in the in the corner of the yard or something and it grows as a standalone plant and you think about kind of the width, the size that it can get to, it doesn't take a great leap of faith to think that that would fill a, a, a you know a, a square foot of of soil below it. So that's generally the figure we would use, uh, and obviously they want to be reasonably evenly spaced um, plants. Coming on to the size, I mean, obviously, they're more likely to uh, survive and develop to fill that if they are larger plants, but even relatively small plants at this time of year, if they're carefully minded, um, can achieve uh, an adequate canopy size and an adequate yield. Certainly, when you consider that if you were to replace them, the crop you would replace them with probably needs to yield half a ton or a ton of hectare more, you say, if you were to put in spring rape, just to cover the costs of re-establishment. Okay, so it's probably probably unlikely. In, 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 so I, I suppose do the numbers kind of carefully and you can probably put up with relatively low plant stands, um, I suppose, economically, um, I, I suppose, in terms of going and replanting as well. So there's plenty of scope there, I suppose. Don't panic, I suppose. Maybe that's the, that's the thing for lots of people. 
Um, you, you mentioned there about smaller plants and managing them. Um, there, there, there's things you can do to kind of manage them up. And we talk about um, the concept of a GAI. You might explain what that is and why it matters in oil seed rate, maybe more so than other crops in the early part of the season. So a, a, a GAI is, is, is what's called a green area index, and it's the meters squared of green material per meter squared of ground. So if you if you went into an oil seed rape crop and you took off all the stems and the leaves and you laid them out side by side flat on the ground, and you sampled that from a meter from a meet the crop from a meter squared of ground. If it covered a meter squared of ground, that would be a green area index of one. If it covered three meters squared, then it would be a green area index of three. Uh, and, and I say that's when they're laid out flat. And what we're aiming for uh, at the beginning of flowering in all seed rape is a green area index of three and a half. Now, obviously, the stems and the leaves when they're growing in the field aren't all flat on the ground they're vertical or, or they're at an angle. So you need a green area index of more than one to capture most of the light. Does that make sense, Michael? It's a... Sure. No, absolutely. That, make, that makes sense for sure. It's like, kind of like a jigsaw, put put them all out and put them down so they all kind of fill in the space underneath it. Yeah, yes, well, that's sure right. That, yeah. Make, that makes sense. Uh, but why does that matter so much in oil seed rape or how can we utilize the numbers that we can get at this time of the year to to help manage oil seed rape along the, along the way? Well, obviously, every piece of green area on a crop requires nitrogen fertilizer and other nutrients to produce it. But the the nitrogen in all seed rape is more highly concentrated than it would be in a cereal. So one unit of green area index of all seed rape leaves contains 50 kilos of nitrogen, whereas one unit of, of wheat leaves and stems would contain about 30 kilos of nitrogen. And all seed rape can produce some very large canopies over the winter. So you could you could at this time of year have an all seed rape crop if it was planted early last year and got away well and there was enough residual nitrogen in the soil, it could have a canopy size of three already. And all seed rape is very efficient at recycling that nitrogen. So if you've got a green area index of three already, the crop only has to put on another half a unit of green area index by the time it gets to flowering to optimize light interception. OK, so it's a, you, you can save huge inputs in terms of your nitrogen fertilizer by accounting for the size of the crop in the spring um, to optimize that canopy size. And I suppose the other thing with all seed rape is if it gets too thick. So if you produce a canopy size at flowering that's significantly uh, greater than three and a half, then you actually start to reduce the yield. And that's because the crop produces too many flowers and while the crop is flowering, all the sunlight that should be contributing to photosynthesis and seed and pod filling is being reflected back by that thick layer of yellow flowers. So you actually reduce yield from getting the crop too thick. And it, is it easy to do that, John, to, to, to overcook it? Like It's very, it's, it's very easy to overcook it. Um, you know, and I suppose before we developed this concept, you know, people would grow a thick crop of all seed rape. They'd have it in the spring. They'd go out and put their whatever 220 kilos of nitrogen on it and never cease to be disappointed in, in you know, in how poor the yield was, that they'd have this very thick crop. They'd have this, you know, huge reflection of light for a few weeks while it should be filling the pods. And then also you tend to get more lodging and that sort of thing, which makes that the crop harder to, harder to harvest. So it, it is easy to overcook it. Um, yes, and you, you know, I would have heard um, years ago, anecdotally in the UK, that people could never believe why their thin crops always, you know, they, the ones we were talking about a few minutes ago, they could, they, they were always surprised by how well they yielded, uh, often as well as or better than their thick crops, uh, and that was really because they were you know applying enough nitrogen to get their thin crops to the correct canopy size and overcooking the big ones so the gai is uh obviously nobody's going to go, go out and cut down plants and kind of arrange them out to see what's there some of us did it some some of us did it in our youth michael <laughs> I'm glad <it> was you, <laughs> <not me. laughs> um but i presume there's a tool to do that how, how does how does one go about doing that the easiest way is to use the uh gai app that you can download to your phone uh, I think it's from, on the BASF website. And basically, you just go out and you take a photograph of the crop. And it's very simple. You you take your phone out. You, uh, you you take a photograph and people ask how high do you need to take it and that type of thing. We calibrated that app 
by going out and taking photographs in the field and then measuring the crop that was there. And the way that we took the photographs was was very scientific. We just tried to miss our feet from the photograph. So you basically stand in the field, you look down and make sure your feet aren't quite in the photograph and just take a photograph. And it's best not to do it on a very bright sunny day because you're particularly if there's raindrops on the crop because you'll get reflectance. Um, so, you know, on on a not very bright day, preferably when the crop's dry and just don't take a photograph of your feet. If you don't have the app on your phone, you can take the photograph and you can also upload it onto uh, onto the website and it will calculate a green area for you. And it's reasonably, it's, it's basically working on the percentage ground area covered by the crop. So it's reasonably accurate up to a green area index of about three. Over and above that, you're pretty close to 100% ground cover. So obviously it's much harder then to discern a crop that's three from five, you know, a crop that's three or a crop that's five. And so then, so if somebody comes back, goes out there and, and we would hope that people are taking that around now, I presume, or maybe is it even a little bit earlier? Now is fine. I mean, it's it's when you're trying to make that decision about your first nitrogen application. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody comes back with one a relatively low, what I suppose two would be, what's a high and what's a low at this time of the year? Is, is, is 0.5 low and too high or is it a different number? 0.5 would be a relatively thin crop, but you could get lower. Um, and you know anything above two, you would consider to be you know quite a thick crop. You're going to need you know you'd be able to cut your nitrogen fairly significantly on a on a canopy size of two. Um, and you're probably somewhere around the normal book value if you have a canopy size of 0.5. So in a, in a normal kind of scenario of of uh, say 0.5 to one, the first application of nitrogen would be going on in or around now i suppose that people can travel at all and the past possibly was a little bit of fertilizer spread uh, maybe in the drier ground at the earlier part of this week um if somebody had a relatively higher gai are they delaying the nitrogen overall or are they just applying less at the same times you would delay michael so you delay the first application okay so you push that right into march then you'd, you'd, you'd be pushing that into march as a as a rule of thumb the crop will take up three kilos of nitrogen a day and it will take up if you apply so if you applied 100 kilos the crop will take up 60 or 70 of that and it'll take it up at a rate of three kilos a day um so 100 kilos of nitrogen it will take the crop somewhere between 20 25 days to take that up and what we're saying is we need that in by the start of flowering so you can kind of if you have a, a ballpark date in your head for when your crop normally flowers you can kind of work back as to when the latest time you can do it is but you'll you don't want to be putting it on too early because you may encourage the crop to get too thick and again produce too many flowers okay and and then there's a final application that we're kind of leaving leaving out for uh kind of i suppose mid flowering if you can get that far to try and uh boost the overall yield kind of late on in the season yeah so that's so the canopy size of three and a half is to intercept the light, but obviously all seed rape seeds are high in protein. Um, and you, so we are, we want to get a late, an application on as late as we can get it evenly spread to supply nitrogen for that protein formation. If you don't do that, then what the crop will do is it will remove the nitrogen from the leaves uh, to, to form the protein in the grain and the crop will will die prematurely and that will reduce yield but re that late application is really as late as you can get the nitrogen evenly spread so if you're on wider tram lines it's going to be harder to to spread that late so if you're on 24 meter tram lines maybe if you have a uh, high mounting for your disc you'll be able to go a bit later or you could put some of it on as liquid uh through a boom um which obviously means you can probably go a bit later again. So there's plenty of options there. So I suppose the key information that you're saying there, if you have a relatively big GAI, well, first of all, measured. Uh, and secondly, then if it is quite big, just delay uh, until for another couple of weeks, probably. Um, whereas if you have the the, the, the slightly lower uh, GAI, probably when you can travel the ground, get on some, maybe a couple of bags of ASN uh, as soon as you can to kind of get that crop um, pushing along. Yeah, but relative, if it's if it's a very small crop, I would be inclined to put smaller dressings on, you okay. know, particularly the first one. You know, thirty kilos of nitrogen should give the crop a kick um, and get it going. Um, 
obviously there's still the risk of well, there's been the risk of wet weather for months now but you know you don't want to be putting large amounts on early and be at risk of that moving down in the soil beyond the crop beyond the roots of the crop it'll be you know it'll be lost to the rivers yes okay um people would be concerned i suppose about sulfur as well john um how much and when should they apply sulfur generally the sulfur is um taken up with the nitrogen okay a total of about 30 kilos of s per hectare but sulfur it does leach but it doesn't leach anywhere near as quickly as um as nitrogen so you could what i would do for preference would be to use a high s compound for the first application get the sulfur on and then use straight nitrogen for the later applications boron john people talk yeah there's a uh, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about boron um, and oil seed rape can suffer from boron deficiency. In my experience, it's relatively rare. It's more of an issue on light soils. Um, so, you know, it would have been an issue on some soils, say, growing beet years ago. Um, so the crop does require boron, but it requires relatively little of it. And there's quite a fine line between boron deficiency and boron toxicity in the crop. So I mean I would I would rather apply boron based on a soil analysis or or a knowledge that uh, a site is prone to boron deficiency and if so a small application of boron but you know I have seen boron deficiency in oil seed rape as I say it's not hugely common um, and certain and it's more likely on lighter soils than heavier soils. Final question, John, just around uh, disease. There's it's been a very wet winter in the past. We've had problems with light leak spot doing serious damage in crops. Where do you think that is at the moment? Um, and should people be, be be doing something about it? To be honest, Michael, I haven't walked a huge number of crops. Uh, we haven't got any oilseed rape in Oak Park this year. We've, we've done a lot of brassica uh, cover crop trials in the past, and unfortunately that means we now have club root on the land, so we've taken the decision not to grow uh, oilseed rape in Oak Park. We've identified it in a number of fields. There may be fields that are clear, but you know, it will very quickly move around the farm on machinery and, and that. So, But the in terms of light leaf spot, it can be very damaging. You need to control light leaf spot before you have the buds uh, there. So really before green bud. So if people go out, uh, take some leaves, put them somewhere warm in a bag, if you can see the symptoms, you really need to get out and treat ASAP. Um, because once it gets into the head, there's, you know, into, into the developing buds, there's not much you can do. And that's where it causes the damage on the buds rather than uh, on the leaves. There's actions to be done, but I suppose like all those kind of things, we are waiting for a little bit of weather uh, for, for cream to dry out in lots of cases. It's... It's just been a difficult year, John. So um look. been a nightmare of year, Michael. But people could at least go out and, and take some leaves. If they can't do anything else, they could do a good walk across the field, gather some leaves up, and you know, they would know if they had light leaf spot and it could then be on the list, like you say, for when people can travel, which is hopefully not too not too much longer. I hear there's a bit of dry weather due next week. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed indeed. John, thanks very much again for your time. Uh, delighted you could join us again. I look we'll be chatting to you again. Okay, no bother. Thanks very much, Michael. So that's it for this episode. And my thanks to John for joining me on the podcast. We'll chat to John again next week where he describes a little bit more about the carbon footprinting of cereals and the new research which has been completed recently. If you enjoyed the podcast, then recommend it to a friend or colleague. And as always, rate, review and follow on Apple or Spotify so you never miss an episode. And for more information, go to chagas.ie. I'm Michael Hennessy. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with more tillage news and advice.